Good morning, everybody. Um, I guess good afternoon. We just uh, turned to 12 o'clock here. So um, thank you uh, all for coming here. We've got a full crowd here. I'm sure we have a full crowd um, on the, the webcast here. It's been three years since we've been in person. So um, we're really excited here um, to, to welcome you, you all to Cytiva and learn a little bit more about the, uh, the, our bioprocessing business. And, and Reiner will, will be up here to make some opening remarks shortly as well. Um, before we get started, um, have to read this. Uh, today's presentation may include forward-looking statements and actual results may differ materially from these statements. Please refer to the, the slideshow and the in, in our website for, for more information here. Um, with that, again, have a really great day here for you. We're going to start. Reiner's going to come up, make some opening remarks, uh, certainly commenting a little bit on the, the news from last night. Um, We'll then go to the biotechnology group here where Emmanuel Ligner and, and team will really give you a little bit more um, look under the hood of, of the great businesses that we, uh, we have here with Paul and Cytiva. You can get a chance to hear from some customers. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll go to a Q&A session before we uh, go to see some, um, some live demos here on the, the Gemma walks. So without um, further ado, I'll invite Reiner up here. Thanks, John. Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to Marlboro, Massachusetts, the North American headquarters of Cytiva. It's great to see so many of you in person, right? After all these virtual conferences that we've had, it's great uh, to have you here in person and also to see so many, so many familiar faces. That's really great. Also, I'd like to welcome all of those that are joining us via the webcast. Thanks for being here today. We have as John just showed us, an agenda that is chock full of important information. And so we hope you have a, a good day here. So with that, uh, as John mentioned, uh, clearly we've had some news here uh, the last 24 hours. So before I jump into sort of the heart of the agenda, uh, allow me to give you just a brief current update. So our strong momentum of the first half of the year uh, is continuing into the third quarter. Our end markets are healthy, and we expect high single-digit base business core growth for the third quarter, and that is consistent with our Q3 guidance, as well as the first half. So now our respiratory testing at Cepheid is tracking well ahead of expectations. In fact, the uh, respiratory uh, testing demand uh, at the point of care where Cepheid has its advantaged solutions is robust, it's resilient, and of course we also see a tailwind here from additional respiratory outbreaks. Now, we anticipate our respiratory testing revenue to be in excess of $500 million in Q3 uh, versus the $325 million that we had originally guided to. <clears throat> now, at the same time, yesterday, uh, we announced uh, our intention to separate the environmental and applied a solutions uh, segment uh, into really what is a premium industrial growth company. And of course, uh, that'll be separated to be an independent publicly traded company. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. But uh, today, we really do want to focus on our colleagues here at the biotechnology group. Uh, and uh, we'll see much more of that in just a minute. So I'll speak to you today more about uh, the EAS separation but also about what Danaher 2024 and beyond will look like post the separation. And then we'll set up uh, the life science evolution, which is important not just because of our repositioning, our enhanced growth and earnings trajectory, but also because it provides the context and the framework in which the biotechnology group will share the progress that they're making. So let's go ahead and jump right in. <clears throat> now, the separation of EAS uh, really allows both Danaher and EAS to realize their full potential. And we expect uh, that transaction to complete here by about Q4 uh, of 2023. Both companies will be more focused, and they'll be able to execute their respective strategies with greater clarity than ever. Now, we're excited for both the team, uh, as well as Jennifer Honeycutt, who will be uh, the president and CEO of the new entity. And you know, Den Jennifer has been with us for over 20 years. In fact, she joined uh, the business via the acquisition 
of Hawk and has tremendous uh, experience through three out of our four platforms with increasing business leadership responsibility throughout the years, international uh, experience, a, a strong DBS leader, and of course, tremendous experience in mergers and acquisitions. So we're really pleased that Jennifer will be guiding us here through that transition until we complete the transaction when she takes over then uh, the public company president and CEO role. <clears throat> now, if we look to the left, you can see here that we've dialed that uh, portfolio uh, into the most attractive uh, areas of both the water quality and the product identification markets. These are the best franchises in the marketplace. They have differentiated business models. So think razor, razor blade, keyed in consumables, outstanding financial profile, and a really attractive sustainability and ESG uh, profile as well. And if you look to the right, you can see that mid single digit growth, over 55% recurring revenue, and adjusted EBITDA margins of 25%. Now, importantly, of course, e, e, for EAS, the Danaher business system, DBS, is foundational. And their commitment to continuous improvement, strong execution, and market share gain will continue as it has for the last 10 plus years. Now, importantly, EAS will also have the opportunity to meaningfully deploy capital to execute its strategy with a bias towards M&A. So that is a real important uh, change here for the EAS team as they continue then to pursue their strategy. So when you bring all this together, outstanding end markets with secular growth drivers, think of protecting the water and the food supply as being critical aspects of the near term but also uh, the long term. Think of these outstanding differentiated business models, a great financial profile, the ability to deploy capital we see all this coming together to drive tremendous shareholder value creation. So now let's fast forward to 2024 and beyond. And what you see there is Danaher, a $25 billion focused science and technology leader that profoundly and positively impacts human health. And as you look at the franchises uh, at the bottom of the chart here, you can see that once again, we've dialed ourselves into the most attractive end markets, buffeted by secular, strong secular growth drivers for the long term, and in aggregate, have a growth profile here that is balanced at high single digits for both segments. Now, I've, I'll, I'll be talking to you about the life science uh, segment in, in much more detail in just a minute, but you can see the exciting uh, growth franchises and brands uh, that we have there. But as we look at the diagnostics franchise, you can see that it is $10 billion. It was just $6.5 billion in 2019, to give you a sense uh, of uh, the development there. And it is once again dialed into the most attractive secular growth opportunities in diagnostics. For example, the underpenetration of molecular testing at the point of care, where Cepheid is uh, positioned as the gold standard, advantaged with the largest installed base and largest menu in the world. Secondly, the decentralization of care, the automation of workflows, because it's so hard to get skilled labor these days, and likely in the future. That's a problem set that the value propositions of our entire diagnostic portfolio addresses head-on, but particularly Beckman Diagnostics. So when you bring all this together, what you have is a $25 billion, faster-growing science and technology, science and technology powerhouse that is having a profound and positive impact on human health. So now let's talk about the power of our portfolio, and it's united by these common business models. For example, we have enormous installed bases. I just thought, spoke about Cepheid. It's the same for Beckman Coulter, the same for Leica Biosystems, and of course, the same for Radiometer as well. These are very large installed bases that have queued in or spec'd in consumable flows. 
that are incredibly sticky, and they are serving high-value, mission-critical applications. We're talking about doctors being able to get the right answer faster and making a prognosis or certainly a diagnosis in order to help uh, a patient. We're also helping pharma, whether large or small biotech, to help develop uh, their molecules, get them through the approvals more quickly, and ultimately commercialize them successfully in order to, once again, profoundly impact human health. Now, you see on the right side the dramatic change in recurring revenues. 2015, 45%, 2024, and beyond, 80%. And of course, in the first instance, you conclude, well, that gives much lower revenue volatility, and of course, in the short term, as we think about the choppiness that we see in the global marketplace, that feels incredibly important. But it is also in the long term. And that's because this uh, recurring revenue gives us more touch points and more customer intimacy and more insights into uh, the pain points and the unmet needs of our customers and fuels our innovation engine. And that fuel allows us then to develop proprietary, higher margin solutions in order to win additional market share. So the flywheel is evident at all levels of this opportunity. Now you bring all that together. I spoke about these attractive end markets, the secular growth drivers, the incredible franchises with their differentiated business models, the power of the Danaher business system, and you can see the sustained leverage we bring to our growth and earnings trajectory for the long term. So we think that our growth re-rates higher for the long term. And you say, well, why do you think that? Well, let's have a look at the left here, where you see Cytiva and Paul together representing a $7.5 billion bioprocessing franchise growing high single digits for the long term. You see Cepheid, more than 10% of our future portfolio growing low double digits. You see our differentiated genomics franchise, consisting of IDT and Aldevron at a billion dollars plus, growing well into the low double digits. You see our life science instruments and clinical diagnostics businesses in which we have invested aggressively to accelerate growth through innovation and improve commercial execution, growing at mid-single digits and plus. And all that comes together to re-rate our long-term growth, core growth, to high single digits. Now, when you combine that with our discipline and the power of the Danaher business system and our bias to deploy capital towards M&A, you see the leverage that that, that provides to double-digit earnings growth. So simply stated, our outstanding portfolio combined with the power of DBS really accelerates our growth and earnings directory for the long term. Now, underpinning all of this is the Danaher business system. That's the case for Danaher as a whole. That's the case for EAS as well. And the Danaher business system, that's the way we run our businesses. That is how we execute. And it's really on the basis of those core values and our shared purpose, helping realize life's potential, that DBS is our sustained long-term competitive advantage. It pulses through all of our processes in all of our operating companies and delivers real value. And I'll show you that real value here in some concrete examples. So DBS is not just a collection of tools. It's a culture. It's who we are. It's how we identify. And it's how we do what we do. Now, sustainability is so important today. And as you can imagine, it's a priority at Danaher as well. In fact, we will be uh, publishing our 2022 sustainability report here in just a couple of weeks. But the team has allowed me to share some facts with you uh, before the actual report publishes. And the way we organize uh, our activities at Danaher around sustainability is along three dimensions. The first one is building the best team. The second is 
innovating products that improve lives and our planet, as well as protecting our environment. OK, well, what progress have we made there? Well, let's start with building the best team where, among many things, we're looking to improve the, the representation of diverse populations. And in 2021, 75% of our new hires were diverse, 75%. Of course, under innovating products, we are investing significantly more in research and development. 30% is nothing to sneeze at. But in addition to that, we are also including sustainable design processes in our innovation engine so that what we design is great for the long term, not just the short term, and of course, helping our customers with their challenges. And then as it relates to protecting the environment, We've committed to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by over 50%, over 50%. And so when we go on our tour here of the facility, you will see sustainability coming to life in concrete terms with Cytiva. So important progress here uh, on the sustainability front at Danaher as well. So now let's switch gears and talk about the evolution of the life science platform over the last years. You know, it all started uh, in 2005 with the acquisition uh, of Leica Microsystems. And since then, we have deployed over $45 billion of capital, acquired over 30 companies. And I have to tell you, as much fun as that was, the organic work that we have done with the Danaher playbook and deploying the DBS tools and driving growth and earnings improvement organically was every bit as much fun as the acquisitions. Having said that, let's look at that, the acquisitions a bit. The way we um, uh, enter a new adjacency is usually by acquiring an anchor asset, an asset that brings new capability and scale to us uh, in um, a new end market. And then we tend to round that out both organically with new capabilities as well as inorganically with bolt-on acquisitions to improve that positioning. And as you think about the Danaher playbook, what do we do? Well, we tend to remove waste. We tend to identify underperforming processes, remove process steps to shorten those processes, and then to accelerate those processes so that we have more resources available to reinvest in innovation and commercial execution for growth. And you can literally feel the flywheel starting to turn as you make progress in applying the DBS tool set to that end. So let's have a look at some of the results after all of that work. Well, on the right at first, you're no you'll notice that the, the platform is repositioned from 15% of biopharma sales, as an, as an example, to roughly 60%. And of course, our colleagues from the biotechnology group will be talking uh, at length uh, about our progress there. At the same time, you see the scale from three plus billion in 2015 to 15 billion in 2021. The growth rate re-rated from low single digits here it says to 25% plus, of course, that was the 2021 uh, growth rate, but let's say high single digits long term, from low single digits to high single digits re-rating that growth. The recurring revenue goes from 45 to 70% and over 1,000 basis points of operating margin improvement. I want you to imagine the, the effect of the compounding at a higher growth and higher margin with that scale difference over time to see the long-term value creation of not only our M&A capabilities, but also the organic capabilities that we deploy via the Danaher playbook for long-term value creation. OK, so how do we do that? Well, let's look at how we accelerate growth through innovation in the life science portfolio. And what we've done here is we've picked the three largest life science instrument group operating companies. And if you focus with me on the right here for just a minute, you'll see SciX, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, 
and Leica microsystems, all of which in that period from 2012 to 2016, you know, grew in aggregate low single digits. Now you fast forward to 2017 to 2021, and in aggregate you see them growing at high single digits. So how'd you do that? Well, let's have a look here at the left. Um, first of all, of course, we talked about the playbook, which allows us to free up the resources to increase investment in innovation. So removing MUDA, waste, shortening processes and accelerating them, and then reinvesting in the business in these examples to have the resources to accelerate innovation. And what do we see? The use of the problem to portfolio tool, which not only allows us to identify customer pain points and unmet needs more quickly, it allows us to do it more precisely. And why is that so important? If you look at the adoption rate of new technologies in the life science market, if you're off just a little bit with the design of your product, it will materially affect the success of your innovation in the marketplace. And SciX has done wonders here with the 7500 triple quad as a case in point, the most sensitive triple quad in the world. The 7600 Xenotoph allows scientists to see more proteins than any other mass spec platform in the world. And you can see that 40% of the 2021 revenue at SciX is attributed to new products. Now, if we look at the accelerated product development tool, this is intuitive. If you're able to reduce your development times, not only do you get to market first to set the new standard, but of course in the same period of time you can do more products because you're using less of your development capacity. And so what you see Beckman Coulter has done is they have launched over 30 new products in the last three years. And that compares to three products in the three years prior to the acquisition. So an order of magnitude improvement in the number of products launched. And look at the impact on the right. Beckman Coulter goes from low singles to high singles, low double digit growth. Very material. Now let's look at product launch excellence. You do all that hard work finding what that unmet need is and you dial it in just right. And you do it with shorter cycle times. But if you blow your launch, you leave a lot of value on the table. And so of course we have a launch excellence tool and Leica is a great example for that where Leica has combined the power of wide field and confocal microscopy at a price point that allows principal investigators to have their own high resolution microscopy solution. And there are many more principal investigators than there are core labs. And so now these investigators can have their own solution in their own lab to look at live cells and understand biologic mechanisms and disease pathways rather than having to send fragile cells through FedEx to a core lab. It's a huge change. And you can see the impact this type of launch excellence has had at Leica, a 40% plus increase from new product revenue in the last three years. So you can see here how the Danaher playbook frees up the resources to reinvest in innovation and is coupled with the DBS tool set to allow us to accelerate our growth, to improve our growth and earnings trajectory. We have a great example here with Paul of the Danaher playbook in action over the longer term. Now for those of you who don't recall, we acquired Paul in 2015 and uh, it was about a low single digit grower and the operating margins were right, you know, in the high teens. And of course we apply the Danaher playbook which is tailored to the needs of each individual acquisition. We reduced GNA, we reduced the cogs of goods sold and we reinvested in innovation through R&D as well as improved commercial execution and sales and marketing. And I think the results on the right speak for themselves going from low single digits to high single digit growth. In fact, it was double digit in 2021. And over a thousand basis points of operating margin expansion. So as you look to the left and you think about the power of compounding higher margins with higher growth rates, we show you here the impact on cumulative operating margin 
and ROIC. Now, the lower dashed line is what Paul would have uh, performed at with cumulative operating margin, with a margin improvement, but only low single-digit growth. And the solid line is the actual result, the higher margin at the high single-digit growth. And you can see the leverage of compounding higher margins at higher growth rates over the long term with more than a billion dollars of additional operating margin. So yes, it's important to get it right early in acquisitions. You've got to get out of the gates quickly. And you've got to do really well in value creation in the first two to three years. But at Danaher, Kaizen is our way of life. Continuous improvement is our way of life for the long term. And you can see the power of that long term value creation here. So now let's have a look at Cytiva's progress since acquisition. And the fact that we are here speaks to the degree of pride that we have in our team that has joined us, the performance that they have shown over the last two and a half years since they have been part of Danaher is nothing short of extraordinary, nothing short of extraordinary. And that's why we're here. And we want to show to you what has been achieved uh, with Cytiva and the biotechnology group. Now, this was a three-phase process for us. This was a complex deal. Phase one, carve it out. And we had, you see this, over 200 transition service agreements which were completed successfully, and GE was a fantastic partner for us in this effort. We had over 3,000 new associates join us, get trained, and deliver value during a pandemic and in a virtual world, not an easy thing to do. And already in unaided awareness, our new brand, Cytiva, is the number two brand in the entire space, two and a half years in. So carving out has been a resounding success. Phase two, operate, take care of your customers, and succeed as an independent operating company within Danaher. And you see here, embracing DBS, over 400 Kaizens in our manufacturing plants to unlock capacity, improve productivity, to be able to supply our customers in the middle of a pandemic. And also improving the on-time delivery of our R&D projects by a factor of two. And if you look to the right, now you see the financial results. We've more than doubled the sales of Cytiva. We've re-rated the long-term growth from what we initially expected to be 6 to 7%, really for the long term here, not talking about year one, two, or three, but talking about the next seven to 10 years, high single digit growth. And then beyond all of our expectations, double digit return on invested capital two and a half years in. And of course, we're reinvesting in the business, a billion and a half dollars here of uh, cash going into expanding our capacities, yes, to help with the supply constraints of the day, but also to be able to supply for the long term and as importantly provide the industry and our customers with the best supply security in the industry. And that manifests itself in over 2x uh, you know, the capacity for single use technologies as just one of several examples which we'll go into in quite a bit more depth. Okay, so phase one and two, phase one, carve out. Phase two, stand up and be a successful company. Phase three, create the biotechnology group. And this is new. We're bringing together Cytiva and that $6 billion franchise with Paul Life Sciences, the $2.5 billion franchise, to give you an $8.5 billion growth juggernaut with $7.5 billion of that revenue being in bioprocessing. Now you bring these two activities together under the biotechnology group, and you have not only the broadest product portfolio in biopro bioprocessing, but also the deepest. When I say the broadest, you can get any point solution that you need in the context of a bioprocessing workflow, or you can get the entire end-to-end workflow, an entire factory, including the clean rooms, the shell, the building, the attachments, everything 
from the combination of Cytiva and Paul Life Sciences. When I talk about depth of the portfolio, this combination can do that not just for monoclonal antibodies, but for cell and gene therapies, for mRNA, for oligonucleotides, for CRISPR-Cas9. You name your therapeutic biologic uh, modality, and this combination can deliver it for you, either a point solution or end to end. At the same time, we have brought together the largest global commercial, technical, and service team in the industry, and not by a little bit. This is a team that can deliver those solutions and support our customers with the value proposition, I'll call it zero headaches, best in class customer experience, helping you whether you're still in the development phase of your biologic molecule, or whether you are working that mo molecule through the entire journey, the clinical trial phases, all the way through to commercialization, we can go that walk with our customers, and they're doing it increasingly every day. Lastly, I'll mention here, with the inside insight that we have gained through this combination, we're able to focus our innovation on what matters most to our customers. Quality. Quality means purity. Purity means less side effects. Yield means more productivity and lower cost for our customers in producing the molecule. But we also focus on total cost of ownership to ensure that uptime contributes significantly to that total cost of ownership. This is unrivaled uh, in the industry, and this combination is truly unique. So I can't wait to see, quite frankly, what else the biotechnology group has in store for us. We're going to see some of that here in just a couple minutes. And so what I'd like to do now is introduce my colleague, Emmanuel Minier, who is the Danaher Vice President and Group Executive of the Biotechnology Group. Emmanuel? Thank you. Thank you, Rainer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening, good morning, if you're on the, on the WebEx. We're going to go deep into the biotechnology creation. Um, I will not be alone presenting. Uh, I will tell you a bit more about the biotechnology group, but I have also three of my colleagues here uh, today with me. Uh, we will talk about how do we differentiate our commercial, our services, our technical capabilities that will be presented by our vice president for commercial and bioprocess, Amanda Halford. Then we will move on. I will come back on stage again and talk to you more in depth about our leadership position in monoclonal antibody. But also I will ask Emmanuel Abad, our vice president for the genomic medicines, to speak about what are we doing for the new modalities. Then we will have Conor McKechnie, our uh, general, uh, our, sorry, our chief commercial uh, marketing officer, sorry, CMO, I'm getting confused now with this title, uh, presenting to you a panel of customers. So we will have two customers, a very large pharma and, and a biotech, um, just discussing with you about how do we serve them. Then we'll come back, we'll have a, a, a small break, and then we'll go into some, some Q&A. So let's go uh, deep about why we're creating the biotechnology group and and, and what we're doing. So just a quick reminder um, about Cytiva first. Cytiva is definitely uh, a leader in bioprocessing, a $6 billion revenue uh, with an extreme talent. Talent on the field, PhDs, masters that are very intimate with the customers, but also um, a lot of uh, uh, field service engineers which are at the, at the customers days in, days out. And they are very well recognized in the industry and are leading expert. We have scale. We'll talk a bit more about that. And we have a differentiated business and differentiated portfolio. What Reiner was explaining is very important. We start at the very early on development of a product in university, in a startup, in a translational uh, academy, at picogram level of protein. And then we help the customers step by step to scale up to metric tons through research, development, and manufacturing. I think, as Reiner has explained, Sactiva was a transformational uh, addition to the life science platform. Paul Life Science is also 
very similar to Cytiva, a leader in filtration and in single-use technology with extreme talent, expert in material science and leading around membranes and filtration technology. They have a differentiated product portfolio. They have scale, global manufacturing, and depth of expert to also serve the customers. It has been an outstanding business in, in, in a very attractive business model. So this is new. We're taking those two outstanding company and putting them together. We're creating an undisputed leaders in the bioprocessing. 8.5 billion of revenue, anticipating long-term performance of high single digits. But I'd like to spend the rest of the day on the bioprocessing 7.5 billion franchise that we have. We are an extending reach to customers around the world. We're focusing on innovation to bring to customers what they need. Products that are going to help the customers to increase productivity and to bring those life-changing therapy faster to the market. So let's talk about which market we are playing into. We're playing into the biologic markets with a market that I'm sure you're very familiar with, but we wanted to give you a bit of overview before we go a bit deeper. Medicine starting early in the 20th centuries with uh, small molecules like aspirin or protopump inhibitors, which are actually manufacturing through a chemical reaction. Well, we are absolutely not in that segment, a bit, but very, very not. What we have been doing for the last 60 years in Cytiva and, and more for Powell, actually, we are really working with medicines which are coming from a cell, biologics. And it started with recombinant protein. It started by a replacement therapy, diabetes patients which don't have enough insulin. Patients which are hemophilic that need factor eight, factor nine, coming from plasma, blood plasma fragmentation. And, and we've been there from the very, very beginning, and we are still in that segment. But more and more, the market has evolved to monoclonal antibody, and we'll talk about this. And then new modalities, new therapies, new tools, oligo, cell engine therapies, mRNA, which of course you've heard with COVID vaccine. The industry is constantly evolving, and we also are evolving with our customers to make sure that we continue to serve them in that biologic market. So this market is a fast-growing market. As you can see, if we look over uh, today, if we look at the pipeline, 60% of the total medicines are biologics, compared to only 20% just 20 years ago. So there's an incremental um, span from our customers, from the industry, into biologics. There's more than 20,000 compounds today in development. Now, of course, not all of them will make it to the market, but it is our role, and you will see that during the game by walk, to make sure that we track every single of those molecules, where they are around the world, and that we serve the customers to make sure that we help them to go faster at incredible uh, yield a very productive way to produce those compounds. And the genomic medicines, those new modalities that Emmanuel Abad will talk to you more in detail, look, 10 times more in pipeline today versus 2015. On the right, you have the approval. You have the products that are coming to market for treating the patients. And as you can see that there is an acceleration of approval. Now, this is only the US data. Think about it. Other market as maybe other biologics, China, Europe, India, and so on. And so you can see that really the biologics and the genetic medicines are still at the very, very beginning of what is coming over the long-term period. So how do we win in this market? Well, as Rainer said, putting Paul and Cytiva together bring to our customers a broader portfolio, not only on the workflow for monoclonal antibody, and we will go a bit more in details later, but also 
in other workflow like mRNA, cell therapies that you will be able to see upstairs later in the Gamba walk, gene therapy using viral vectors, etc. We have a leading position in upstream, a leading position in downstream, and just to give you a bit of reference, we'll talk a bit about the single-use technology, which is really the way, the modern way of producing those biologics. Our revenue in 2021 was in excess of $1 billion. But it's not only about the portfolio. It's not only about the breadth of a portfolio. We are wrapping up those high technology product with an incredible team, an incredible service, scientific service that help the customers to do more, to go faster. And it's a global scale. Our commercial team and again, you will hear that more in details, are really capable of helping the customers all around the world. This is a global business. You can have a molecules which have been developed and, and, and find in California, which is moving here to the East Coast, and then which is moving to Europe. You can have a molecule started in China, which get produced in Korea or actually get produced in multiple centers around the world, not only in Korea, but in Switzerland or in the East Coast. You need to be able to serve the customers with the same level of quality product and on technical support all around the world, and you will see that we have the scale. We not only have the commercial scale, but we also have the production scale. We'll talk about security of supply, something which is extremely important for the industry today, and I will explain you why a bit in a few more slides. And as Rainer said, we are constantly in, 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 um, investing in organic, in new product, in new technology, working with our customers, having collaboration, and you will hear with our customer panel some of the collaboration that we are doing and why we cannot do it alone, they cannot do it alone, and therefore collaboration is important. And we have the scale to do this. We're investing more in R&D every year. We also have an incredible capabilities of doing inorganic investment. And this is something which has been really fantastic for us joining Danaher, is to be able to invest capacity when we need to, is to be able to make the acquisition when we need to, and we'll talk a bit about that later. Really, our day-to-day -day life uh, and, and, and our day-to-day -day mission is to really advance and accelerate those life-changing therapeutics with our customers to go faster to market, but also to reach more patients around the world. So let's go through an example of a workflow for, for, for molecules. This is a workflow of a monoclonal antibody. I'm going to go quickly explain you a bit of what, we are, what you are showing here, what we are showing here, but you will have an opportunity to go a bit more deeper later, but actually seeing all the different products one behind the others. To manufacture a monoclonal antibody, you take one cell. You genetically modify this cell. And to make a biologic, actually, your cell is your factory. Your cell is going to produce the protein you want. So you take that cell and you grow it. What you need to provide to the cell is food, cell culture media. You need to grow into bioreactors. Then when the cell is ready and when you change the chemical environment of the cell, the cells start to express your protein or to produce your protein. You end up with plenty of things that you don't need and the protein you need. So you are going to go into clarification steps where you separate all those different bits. Then you need to capture the protein that you want. It's your capture steps. And what you do right after is you make sure that you are no contamination, so you do a viral inactivation. You filter, basically, to remove virus. You cannot sterilize a protein. You cannot heat it. It will die or disappear or degrade. From there, you move into an intermediate, and you're only 95% pure at that point of time, so you want to continue to purify your protein. So you go into what we call polishing steps, that's chromatography steps, one step, three, two steps most of the time. You do another viral filtration, and then you go into formulation, which is going to be your final formulation. At that point of time, most of the time, the product is what we call an API, an active product ingredient, and you freeze it here, 
or you go straight to fill and finish. To be able to fill and finish, you just what we you need a, you need a machines and some consumable called uh, buck field, and then you introduce your product into vial or into your final um, injectables like a pre-loaded uh, field uh, syringes. Look at where PAL is in that workflow: clarification, barrel inactivation, barrel filtration, formulation, and sterile filtration. At acquisition, PAL was about, Life Science was about a billion dollars and a single use revenue of about 200 million dollars with leading position in filtration. Now when you put PAL and Sightiva together, this is what happened. I'm going to do it again because I like it. A complete solution to the customers. From the very, very beginning, from the cell to the vial from an idea to a drug delivery. And this type of complete workflow is not only available in monoclonal antibody, we'll see letters, a kind of slightly different, but a same similar complementary of pal and Cytiva for other workflow, such as viral, viral vectors and, and mRNA. Today, our bioprocessing business is $7.5 billion, of which a single use technology is in excess of a billion dollars and we really anticipate a long-term growth rate of high single digit. Cytiva and Paul together is an incredibly offering to the customer and therefore in an incredible position. We are so much stronger together and this is why we're doing it. Because for the customers, it matters to have a complete solution. Our customers do not want to take time to take a machine from one company, a machine for another company, a consumable for this company, and try to put it together. It is easier, it is faster to work with a complete solution provider, but not only on the tools, on the consumables, and also on the service, and the deep scientific experience and expert that goes with it. Now, when we don't have only those products, we need to wrap it up with an incredible service for our customers. On the left, you have two services, one called Fast Track in, in Cytiva, and Paul has a quite very similar services, but I'm going to explain you how those services fit together. So what are we talking about when we talk about services? Basically, we are working with customers on their process to optimize their process from cell line development, optimization of the cell line, optimization of the production of the protein at the cell line level to make sure that the yield is improved, increased produ productivity in downstream, making sure that the customer is choosing the right chromatography resin that is given the maximum yield. Working together to scale up. As Rainer said, as I explained earlier, we are capable of helping the customers with a complete workflow, not only at manufacturing scale, but at lab scale, from picogram of protein to metric ton of protein. Fast Track have been around for 30 plus years, and in China, more than 15 years. You will go through the labs there. This is one of the labs that we have around the world, where really the customers is bringing their processes, and our scientists, our PhDs are working with them, hands to hands, to make sure that we get the best and most robust processes. Processes which can be transferred to other places around the world. We have fast track unit in Shanghai, in Seoul, Korea, in Tokyo, Japan, in Mumbai, in India, in Europe, and here in the United States. And PAL is adding on services in Germany and in the UK with more than 400 experts in filtration to make sure that we help the customers to validate those, feast, those filters for those incredible, important molecules. We also have more than a thousand field service engineers everywhere around the world which are here to make sure that they can help the customers with a bit of education on the machines or on the equipment or just to make sure that those equipment are up to date with the latest software, which are working absolutely perfectly, especially when you are in a GMP environment. Again, an incredible scale 
to serve the customers from R&D, development, to commercialization of those compounds. Now, talking about scale, I think it's always good to give numbers when we talk about scale. Pal and Sativa together, it is 16,000 associates located in more than 41 countries, I think, if my memory is correct. Yeah, actually, it's written there, so I should just read. 110 countries where our products are available. We are selling our product in more than 110 countries. We have 36 manufacturing sites all around the world, and we have more than 20 R&D and innovation centers. But something maybe which is more and which has been more exciting since we joined Danaher is our ability to invest in capacity of production, our ability to bring, to reduce lead time to our customers by adding more capacity. We've committed to $1.5 billion of capacity expansion. We shared that last year across 2021 to 2025. And as you can see, we are really investing in every single important product line, cell culture media, the food for the cell, single use technology, which are those um, disposable products that we will talk a bit more later, chromatography resin, and membrane and filtration. Those investments are ongoing, but as you can see, we are doubling at a minimum the capacity of production in many of those products. And we have a commitment to reduce lead time for our customers up to 85% versus of where we are today. This has been a game changer for us. But not only this, we have used and leveraged the DBS tools to make sure that we deploy those capacity of production in a record speed. By leveraging DBS tools like visual project management, daily management, and Kaizen when we face problems, PSPs, we've been able to deploy in Cardiff, in Wales, in the UK, 120,000 square feet single-use manufacturing plant in 15 months, which is 30% faster than when we used to do it in the past. And this is just demonstrate where the DBS is an incredible power tool for a company like Sativa, which is just joining a bit more than two and a half years ago. This has helped us to double the capacity in 15 months. We have also leveraging the DBS in our organic um, R&D. We have invested in excess of $100 million of incremental annual R&D spend. And when we deployed those capitals, we have only one thing in mind, customer needs. And today, customers want speed and productivity. So it is about accelerating time to market. It is about improving yield. And it is, of course, about operating cost reduction for our customers. Those are examples of recent launch that we have from Sitiva, the Acta Oligosynthesis. We are the leading companies in the oligosynthesis uh, equipment. Paul have launched a modular bug fill system, which I show in the, in the workflow, which is at the end, just before fail and finish. And then an example that you will be able to see live upstairs when we talk about cell therapies, it's a chronicle uh, digital tool, which is the first GMP manufacturing automation software for tracking um, the CAR T uh, cell therapy. Over, since 2020, we have increased by two times the revenue from our new product as a contribution. Again, something that is, is, is really great for us now that we are part of, of the Danner House. But not only we've been busy with capacity, with incremental R&D, we've been also capable of making some strategic M&A and strategic acquisition not only in workflow differentiation, but also sometimes just in capacity. Intermountain, for example, has been one where we have added capacity for high purity water, for buffer, but also brought new capacity for new uh, special liquid for cell culture media, but also for the genomic medicines. Precision Nano, very important acquisition for us. Emmanuel Abat will give you a bit more de details, but when you 
inject an mRNA, when you create an mRNA, it's incredibly fragile. You need to protect the mRNA, and what you do is you encapsulate the mRNA into a lipid nanoparticle. You put a little fat around it, if you want, to protect it and to be able to inject into the human body as a delivery system. Well, Precision Nano System is a leading company of microfluidic dynamic to encapsulate mRNA into LMP. But not only they have that incredible machines that you can see uh, a bit later behind and upstairs as well, which can be used at research scales, development scale, or GMP manufacturing scale, but they have also an incredible library of those LMP, which are so critical because they are going to work with the customers in a service relationship to develop and to try and to test those unique LMP for the customers. GoCDCO is a complete different acquisition. We are moving into a digital world. And our customers can gain a tremendous amount of time if they do in silico simulation of their processes, in particular in downstream. How I'm going to capture, how I'm going to polish my uh, monoclonal antibody. This is a very interesting software which helps the customers to reduce their development time and bring um, uh, modern tools, I will say, to their, to, to their development, robust simulation in silico, and then that they can try at the bench. And finally, from Canada, from Vancouver, the leading provider of robotic aseptic filling, which is very important for the last part of the process that I show, not only for monoclonal antibody, but very important for gene therapy and mRNA and personalized medicine, and I think Emmanuel will, will talk about this. We've deployed more than $500 million of bioprocessing m and since ITI acquisition, again, something that we are super proud about, and we have been able to do this because of, of Danaher uh, business model. Now, in summary, I hope you feel that I am super excited, <laughs> that this is a dream come true for me. I've been in this industry for 18 years, and the combination of Paul and Saitiva is incredible. We created an undisputed leaders in bioprocessing with global reach, with long-term growth opportunity because the market is solid, because our products are unique, and because our talent are phenomenal. We've differentiated, we're a comprehensive, comprehensive portfolio, we have a commercial reach, which is undisputed, incredible, and I want to talk a bit more time about this, but I'm going to ask our VP of commercial and bioprocesses, Amanda, to do so. Amanda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuel. Good morning, everyone. Um, Emmanuel has talked you through our technologies, our market, and our future. And so I want to take some time to um, talk about how this impacts our customers, how bringing Cytiva and PAL together will be better for our customers, enable us to drive an enhanced customer experience, and get better outcomes, positive outcomes, for our customers and for the biotechnology group. I'll touch on our commercial strategy how we, a strategy of following the molecule to really drive our commercial action, how by adopting DBS, we really drive competitive advantage by continually challenging ourselves that we can improve our commercial processes and improve that customer experience, and how we do that through our team of scientists and engineers to deliver best-in-class service and problem solving. So Emmanuel talked you through the evolution of the biologics industry, how it's gone from a few molecules uh, in the 80s to you know, a multitude of modalities and um, molecules today. But what does that mean for our customers? In the 80s, we had a few global biopharma customers. But today, we've seen an explosion of customers through academic translational centers, through to biotech. We've gone from a few global customers to thousands of customers. And that gives us a fantastic opportunity to nurture those customers through the, through the development process. But what, are the, what do our customers do? No matter who they are or what molecule they're working on, 
whether they are a small biotech or an academic lab or a large biopharma, they're all working through the same development process. Starting out in preclinical, they have an interesting molecule, we want to test in non-humans, through to phase one, where we start to look at patient uh, safety in human, in human clinical trials. All the way through to commercial launch, it's always the same process. And you can see that the majority of our revenues today come from the later phases. So looking at phase three and commercial manufacturing. This is when our customers are scaling up for large scale trials and moving into commercial manufacturing, which is repeat manufacturing. So today, our revenues come from those commercialized biologics. But the heart of our work starts early in the phase, at the preclinical and phase one stage. There you can see there are thousands of molecules in those phases, and all of those many customers working to develop them through that process as effectively as possible. And for us, it's important to engage in those early phases, because that's where we partner with our customers to help them develop and improve their processes, and in doing so, design in our products, help them choose the best resin or media or filtration product for their process. And that's what will guarantee us our future revenue streams. So if we look at our customers, from academia through to the CDMOs, we see different customer segments. And whilst they're all doing the same thing in the development process for the pharmaceuticals, they actually have very different needs at the same sort of phase. So if you take, say, phase one, preparing a molecule for your first in-human in trial, and you'll need some uh, CGMP material to, to, to put into the patient. You know, if you're looking at a, bio, a biotech company, small company, maybe it's the first time they've, they've uh, sort of achieved this, this uh, step, they may not have all the in-house knowledge to know how to do that. They may not have all the, the talent they need to be able to, to progress in that phase. And that's why they would partner with somebody like us to provide help, knowledge, advice as to how to do that. We'd engage a service in process development to help them determine that process. But if you look at, say, a large biopharma company, they probably have a lot of expertise in that area. They will have developed many molecules. And they're more likely to come to us to work with us in partnership, say, develop or choose the best product for their particular process. We may, may work with them on customizing a product to really optimize their manufacturing process. And so customers have different needs. So as we follow the molecules through the phases, we organize our sales teams around the customer segments. And that enables us to deliver our products and our services um, in the best way to a specific customer, to have differentiated customer value propositions and really deliver that locally at the customer, that, there where the customer is. And so we have an organization which has this global infrastructure, a global framework, and by that I mean process, systems, and knowledge, but we deliver it locally to the customer. And this is where the scale of Parlay Sciences and Cytiva coming together will really enhance that customer experience as we increase our coverage in the market. With over 4,000 um, associates who are in customer-facing roles, and if you remember earlier, Emmanuel said we have 16,000 associates. So that's a quarter of our associates in customer-facing roles working locally with the customers to really understand their needs and provide that relevant uh, solution. So the 4,000 associates in over 100 countries, we're very local. We're working with our customers. We drive a real customer intimacy through those relationships. We're able to understand the need at any phase of the process for a customer segment, and we're able to bring in the right scientists and technical um, resources to, um, to, to solve that problem, to work on that need. And we know this works. We know it works well, because the feedback from our customers tell us that we have a 96% customer satisfaction for our service. That's a fantastic achievement. I'm very privileged to lead a team that are able to deliver that day in, day out, across so many different customers globally. But whilst that is good, we know we can do better. But what's important, we know we have to continually innovate and evolve to stay ahead of the game. And that's where really we can leverage DBS. DBS, the philosophy and, tool, and toolbox that we use, um, really challenges every day to improve and to um, question how we, how we work, 
how efficient we are, how we can get better. And give you a couple of examples. Um, by deploying standard work for the lead generation process, we were able to increase the quality of our leads by 20%. That meant that our leads were more relevant, more timely, in the way in which they were delivered to our sales force. So through a process that we've developed for, developed for screening globally, we're able to drive those leads out to our sales force in a timely way through our CRM. And that has resulted in us acquiring over 1,000 new customers, 1,000 new biotech customers over the last 18 months. So we can really see DBS in action as we improve those commercial processes. It brings a rigor that you would usually find in a manufacturing environment into a sales environment. So we combine that with our scientists and our engineers, and it really enables us to differentiate our customer approach and experience. We've also used D DBS in terms of visual and daily management um, to track uh, molecules through that development process. So we are able to visualize globally a molecule at, and track it through every phase of the, of the funnel. We're also able to track it globally. Our customers move their projects around. Maybe they do their research in California, their development on the East Coast, and then send the manufacturing of a commercial molecule uh, to Ireland, for example. And so we're able to track over time, over the process, uh, geographically, where these molecules are going. And so we don't drop the ball. We're able to make sure we can continually uh, track that. And that gives us that, that great opportunity to design in, follow the molecule, and really achieve the revenues in those phase three and commercial stages of manufacturing. So I've talked about how it's important to you know, continually improve uh, processes, but we also have to focus on you know, evolving our services. Services are important because they really create that intimacy with the customer. It takes your relationship from transactional to more of a partner relationship. As we engage with a customer to improve um, and add value to their, to, to their process, and by that I mean helping to increase their yield, reduce the time or reduce the cost through any step of the process, that's where we can really develop that long-term relationship that's needed to take um, a molecule from early phase, work with the customer from early phase through to late phase. And here we've got uh, some really good examples. Uh, Emmanuel referred to earlier to fast track and process development. So this is something in Cytiva we've done for over 30 years, uh, helping customers optimize uh, upstream and downstream processes. Uh, for the last 15 years, we've been doing that in China. As we combine with PAL, we now have um, more of a global footprint to do this. We're able to do this across the filtration process as well. And we're also able to ex expand across more modalities. So not just MABs, but gene therapy, viral vectors, and such. But it could be as simple as providing training and education services. Talent is scarce in the biotech industry. And uh, the ability to train and uh, bring people, like uh, operators, at a customer's manufacturing site to a point where they are able to go into the manufacturing facility and be effective in their work. We have ways of doing that in a virtual way. We're able to do that with speed. We're able to do that with efficiency and really help our customers um, gain on productivity in their manufacturing suites. So by having this range of services which we can apply at different points in that development cycle, we really are able to drive a really close customer relationship, enhance the customer experience, and build that relationship over time across the development cycle. So really, having that differentiated commercial model, it's about having the local um, resources supported by the global infrastructure that enables us to work with our customers from lab to commercial manufacturing. DBS is really helping us drive our um, improvement philosophy, really keeping us challenged and sharp to enhance our competitive advantage. But most of all, it's our teams of scientists and engineers who are out in the field every day working with our customers and bringing those services and bringing those solutions uh, to help them get their therapeutics to market faster. And so with that, I'll hand back over to Emmanuel, who will take you through the uh, monoclonal antibody process. Indeed. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you. I will see you back for, for the Q&A session. So we're going to go a bit more 
deeper in the portfolio and, and more portfolio specific to some of those biologics. And, and we will start with the monoclonal antibody. We'll talk about our leadership position in the monoclonal antibody. We'll talk about why the monoclonal antibody is so important today, our portfolio differentiation, and probably more important, we'll give very clear example on how we help our customer to really accelerate their molecule to market through flexible manufacturing solution. So remember this slide. Now we are in monoclonal antibody, MNL abat, which will follow my second presentation, will take care of the cell and gene therapy. So why monoclonal antibody? I think Rainer shared the slide earlier about the Dana hair revenue is around 60% coming from monoclonal antibody. It's over the last five years, the fastest growing segments of the market with more than 50% of molecule in development. Biosimilar has increased significantly as well. Biosimilar is actually very good because biosimilar brings those life-changing therapy to more patients, to people that could not ac access and could not afford the originator. So we're supporting as well biosimilar, but biosimilar is also boosting the monoclonal antibody market. And if we look at high growth market, places like China, it's a bit behind around monoclonal antibody, but they have accelerated dramatically their spend on the biologics. And if we look at the data over the last uh, 10 years, it's in incremental of 25% spend on biologics. And this is really a market which is catching up and a market where we are very well positioned as well. So if we look at the monoclonal antibody pipeline, we're expecting growth at double digit over the next five years. So what is our offering in this? Do you remember our PAL and Sactiva combined portfolio? You can see below circle that shared with you our vision about our own product completeness. The comprehensiveness of the portfolio, if you want, for every single part. We're leading in the cell culture and, and, and single use parts. We are leading in downstream chromatography and we are very strong in filtration. But I want to go a bit more in detail about this. And today, this incredible portfolio, this incredible combined portfolio is used in more than 90% of all approved monoclonal antibody. And this gives us the annuity that we were talking earlier, the 80% annual annuity which is coming. Now, how do you have a differentiated portfolio? We'll go through cell culture media, single-use technology, chromatography and filtration. But let's start with cell culture media, which is, you remember, the food for the cell. And how have we grown market share over the last five years? Well, first of all, security of supply. We talk about those global molecules that are made in many different sites. We talk about the fact that the customers want a service which is impeccable. Well, we have manufacturing sites in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. And which have the same quality, the same tools, the same quality system, the same product line. So we can serve multiple customers at different places in their own network. This is a huge differentiation. But our production also has a unique control system of the media purity, which gives profile of every batch at really small parts by billions of data. We are capable of differentiating our offering with an incredible control system of impurity. And then we have services. We talk about fast track services, we talk about the SLS services from PAL, those two combined services. And Amanda just gave you a bit more details about it. Well, we also offer that services in cell culture media. Cell line development, cell culture media optimization, feed optimization. Again, working with the customers to improve their productivity. And all this are giving us the opportunity to grow faster that are appear in this segment and gain market share. So 
Let's talk about single-use technology, but before we go about our portfolio and our offering, maybe I should explain a bit of the history of the industry. To go back to the recombinant protein, the insulin, for example, this was manufacturing at the very beginning and still today in a very large biomanufacturing plant, which were stainless steel. Very complex, all in stainless steel, very unflexible, very expensive to build. With the evolution of science, the cell, which is your production plant, if you want, the cell have evolved and the technology has evolved around the cell and the cell can produce more protein. So the size could be reduced. And then company like Paul or us in Sativa brought new technology to the customers. Technology which are much more flexible. You don't need a stainless steel complex plant anymore. You just need a workflow, as I showed earlier, that you will see later with silicone tube, with aseptic connectors, with biorator bag, which are for one batch. So you have your equipment, you make your batch, you take your entire flow pass, your entire bioreactor bags, the spray pack column that you will see as well in chromatography in downstream, and then you move them away and you can make another batch. This has been a revolution for the industry because it brings cost of goods sold reduction up to 30% in average. It brings plants which are much more smaller, smaller footprint, so cheaper to build, 40% cheaper investment cost, but it brings also extreme flexibility. In one plant, you can do different molecules. You can do a campaign in one molecule and do a campaign with another molecule. It reduces the turnaround time because you don't have to clean those stainless steel plants with a lot of water, a lot of chemicals, and therefore, it reduces your carbon footprint, it reduces the use of water, it reduces the use of energy. So today, 90% of the biomolecule being developed are developed using single-use technology. And this is where we are leading the pack with revenue with more than a billion dollars in 2021. But how do we differentiate ourselves? Well, first of all, a very complementary and comprehensive portfolio. Not only we have single-use technology for small volumes, but for also large volume, not only in upstream, in the cell culture media, in the cell growth area, but also in the purification area, in the downstream, as you can see in the second graph there, where we provide flow paths and prepack column, which give a lot of flexibility, a lot of, of uh, speed to the customers. We are the leaders in the fastest growing category of tools for bioprocessing monitoring, uh, bioprocessing manufacturing. And again, from the R&D development to manufacturing. Now, chromatography. Well, chromatography, this is something that we've been doing for more than six decades. The first chromatography resin was launched in 1959. I'll tell you a story in the next slide. We have an incredible expert team with the largest R&D team around the world focused on purification, focused on those unique steps of capture and polishing steps. We have an incredible portfolio, more than 80 different resin, but resin that you can find in very different format, from one ml, very small column, pre-packed column, to 60 liter pack. And we have also the equipment that goes with it, which is also so important. And we have the largest capacity of manufacturing of more than a million liters as installed capacity. And you may have heard that we are building a second site in Michigan, in the US, to increase our capacity further and to be able to have an incredible security of supply for the industry. And we want to maintain the leadership in chromatography. And so this is uh, really an area where we have an incredible strength. And the reason is we started extremely early on. But let me tell you the story about the first chromatography resin launched in 1959 called Cephadex. 60 plus years later, this product is still growing. It is still used in more than 50 approved biologics today. And not long than two months ago, 
I open a brand new site to manufacturing more of those products because the demand is still there and it was part of the capacity of expansion that, that we've done in, in Uppsala, Sweden. And the reason that it really matters it's that our customers today, which are investing billion dollars in their compound, wants to make sure that they are partnering with a supplier which is going to be here for the next 60 years. So the trust has been built up by us continuously manufacturing product to the same quality with the right quantity to be delivered on times for all those customers along all those decades. When I joined the company about 18 years ago, our capture set product far and the, the, the best product we had was Map Select. We launched Map Select Sure, Map Select Sure LX, and four years ago we launched Prisma A, which is today the golden standard in that capture steps. And during that time, if we compare the product, we've increased productivity to customers in terms of how much protein you can capture when you do that chromatography step by more than two times. This is a golden standard today and we will continue to invest to bring to the customers better chromatography resin. It's based on innovation, it's based on relationship and intimacy that we have with customers as Amanda explained. Now let's move to filtration. Pal is an incredible leader in filtration. It has decades as well of experience on membrane technology on encapsulation of those membranes into filters. More than 10,000 patents around filtration, around separation. All the innovation that we are doing is about higher yield, higher flow speed, and longer life of those cartridges, those filters. We have an incredible portfolio but I think what is more important is we have scale. Global manufacturing footprint, technical services, support capabilities. And I just want you to remember one numbers around filtration. In 2021, we delivered to customers more than 5 million units of PAL filters in the life science industry. When there is a problem for filtration, when we have customers with a challenge on separation needs, this is a place to go. PAL is well known for solving those customers' problems. Now, we spoke about speed, we spoke about the customers that want to have this one solution. Let's go a bit more in details about this. About 10 years ago, we launched Flex Factory and QBio. You may have heard about this in the industry. And what it is, is basically when a customer is looking for capacity of production, they can come to Cytiva and we will work with them to deploy that capacity of production in record time. We will take on the project, we will work on, with them on the design of the factory, we will work with them on the planning of the delivery of the product, we will plan with them on the automation because we will provide a fully automated factory for them in a record time. If the customers have a building, this is a flex factory. But if the customer do not have a building, just a greenfield, we will build the factory for them using the QBio technology, which is a modular facilities. We've done that for very large customers, such as Pfizer or Lonza in China. And the benefit for the customers is a reduction of operating expenses, a reduction of capital expenditure up to 50%, but more importantly, a reduction to time to market up to 50%. One stop shop, key term project, one point of contact, multiple parallel track, which give us the ability to really go fast for the customers. And this is proven. We've done that in more than 100 times. Well, 127 times to be precise. Because in the last 18 months, we sold 27 more flex factory around the world. And we are doing this not only in, moto in monoclonal antibody, but also for viral vectors and also for mRNA, for vaccine. 
production. So I think maybe you'll be a bit tired about listening to my French accent, so what I'll propose is that we watch a short video and then, and then we will wrap, it, wrap up the monoclonal antibody and, and I will pass um, the microphone to, uh, to Emmanuel Abad. Can you play the video, please? Cytiva's Flex Factory is a manufacturing platform for key biologics. The end-to-end -end integrated solution helps Biopharma establish agile manufacturing capacity in a new or existing facility, maximizing throughput and efficiency, no matter the space. Manufacturing processes are automated from cell culture to fill of the final product. And our single-use technology and modular design allows our customers to modify their workflow efficiently, reducing downtime during runs and between batches. For biomanufacturers who are quickly evolving to meet the demands of smaller batch personalized medicines, the Flex Factory platform delivers the agility and speed they need to bring future therapeutics to patients around the world. So in summary, we have a leading position in monoclonal antibody which is today the largest class of biologics. We have scaled and differentiated portfolio with leadership across the bioprocessing workflow. And we have this incredible differentiated solution of flexible manufacturing solution to help our customers to be more efficient, to reduce cost, and accelerate time to market. But we have that not only in monoclonal antibody, and I think it's time to speak about the genomic medicines. So I apologize, another Emmanuel with another French accent. Thank you, Emmanuel. Yes, more French accent indeed. Um, it's a pleasure being here and have the opportunity to share with you our progress and plans for genomic medicine. mRNA needs no introduction, of course, and I'm sure you're, you've heard or are familiar with cell and gene uh, therapy. Um, they have the potential to bring transformative change to, uh, to healthcare. They also come with significant manufacturing uh, challenges. And so what I'm going to share with you is how we see that as an opportunity for us to make a difference by solving big problems. As we do that by setting standards for this new wave of biologics and build a long-term sustained business franchise. So I'm going to talk about um, the basics of genomic medicine, give you an overview, and talk about the manufacturing challenges that come with these new uh, therapeutics. Um, I will then take you through uh, the positions we've developed over the past 10 years in genomic medicine, and how we continue to innovate and partner to make this uh, space progress. So by now you're very familiar with this page, um, but really, you know, what we've done over the past 50 or 60 years is really fundamental, and we see that as the enabler to the future. The expertise we've developed in biomanufacturing, the scale we have, our ability to invest, uh, and our business model of s installing factories and then generating annuities. This is how we are taking to genomic medicine. You might now wonder what we mean by stimulate, modify, harness. So here's what we mean. Um, when monoclonal antibodies do a fine job, a great job at managing, moderating a disease, genomic medicine have actually the potential to cure the disease. How? Well, monoclonal antibodies, you produce, you must produce proteins, you inject them to the patient. Now, that doesn't have a permanent effect, and so you need to keep repeating the, the treatment over the, the length of the disease. With genomic medicine, we inject the patient with genomic information and we turn the body into the factory. And by doing so, we induce a permanent cure, a permanent effect. There's different ways to do this, okay? And trying to simplify and, and bring up four uh, workflows here. The first one is gene therapy. So gene therapy, we take a piece of genetic information, we put it into a virus, inject the virus, the virus goes in the cells, it infects the cells, 
And once it's in there, start producing the protein of interest. As you, I'm sure, know, there is already a couple of commercially available drugs targeting rare disease. No later than a couple of weeks ago, hemophilia A, uh, a treatment against hemophilia for hemophilia A was approved in Europe, opening the door for broader population type disease uh, management. Gene editing therapy, in this case, um, same virus vector, but we use techniques such as CRISPR to come and modify the genome of the patient, and that's how you induce a permanent treatment. mRNA therapy, um, of course, no introduction needed. Is you've heard from Emmanuel, in this case, we encapsulate a little piece of mRNA in a lipid. The lipid is delivered to the cells, express the proteins, the famous spike protein in the case of, uh, of COVID. And lastly, cell therapy, which is a bit of a different workflow and manufacturing process. In this case, we take the cells of the patient, we take them to the lab, we modify them, we educate the immune system to go and target cancer in general and re-inject them into the patient. Now, the manufacturing challenges associated with those therapies. Uh, for monoclonal antibodies, you must produce those proteins, you inject them, it's the same treatment for every patient. In this case, these are very personalized treatments. So we're looking at much smaller scale equipment. In this case, where the cell was the factory in the case of monoclonal antibody, in this case, the cell is the therapy. And the virus is part of the therapy. Virus and cells are extremely fragile. Some people compare manipulating virus as manipulating snowflakes. And so they need to be handled with extra care. And that requires new, new consumables, new hardwares. In fact, we're at the very early stage of uh, those therapies. Um, and we're at a point where by innovating, we have the opportunity to set the standards of how those therapies are going to be manufactured in the future. Genomic medicine for the biotechnology group is still a very a relatively small part of our activity. It's the fastest growing part of our, uh, of our business. Um, huge investments going into the space over the past 10 years, and you've uh, the announcement from President Biden earlier this week, a lot of this cancer money is actually going to go into genomic medicine. Thousands of clinical trials, hundreds of them in late stage. Um, so this is a, really a space that is, that, is, uh, that is maturing. And the disease, you know, started with rare disease, going into cancer, and going into broader um, uh, chronic disease, and of, of course vaccine, expanding the opportunity for patients. Now, before I go into how we serve this industry. Uh, I'd like uh, you to hear the story of a, of a, of a patient, and we're going to invite Emily uh, Whitehead to tell, tell you her story. You know, I wake up blessed every day to still be Emily's father. My wife, Carrie, who works in research, uh, noticed that uh, Emily had blood on her gums twice when she was brushing her teeth. Um, I, something's wrong, and I Googled it. I was like, you know, holy cow. We had Emily uh, admitted at the Hershey Medical Center on a morphine pump, and she had cancer. One of the things I love about life sciences is the impact we have on people. We make a difference, right? And 20 years ago, we used to measure success with how many more months can a patient live without the cancer progressing? Today, we're able to use the word cure. We knew standard treatment, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery wasn't gonna fix her. So one of the best moves we did is enter, enter her as the first child in the world. Uh, to have her T cells trained to recognize and kill her cancer. What is cell therapy? At a very high level, it's empowering the body's own immune system to attack and fight cancer. And we do that by taking the patient's own T cells out of their body and genetically reprogramming it. And when put back into the body, the T cell docks with the cancer cell, it sends its normal signaling to the body's immune system to attack the cancer just like it would any other disease that the body gets. 
And basically, that's that in a nutshell is cell therapy. So this is the workflow for CAR T. In fact, those are pretty much the instruments that were used to develop the therapy for, for Emily. Um, we've started investing in that space about 10 years ago. And really, at the very beginning, we partnered with leading uh, science institutions, uh, tweaking our bioprocesses equipments, and thereafter developing bespoke dedicated equipments. You'll get to see the workflow and all the equipments uh, upstairs during the Gemba uh, visit. So I'm not going to take you step by step, but you'll see, you'll get to see it all. Um, the results of these 10 years of work is that we are now designing in most of uh, cell uh, therapy available commercially. We're designing in every of the five CAR T therapy that are uh, available commercially. And we're the only one that is actually able to do back to the flex factory to do an enterprise cell and sell the complete workflow end-to-end -to, -end to customers. Another workflow is the mRNA workflow, and this is how you make the COVID uh, vaccine. All right? it, st it starts with DNA, then RNA, then it gets encapsulated into a lipid using our PNI instruments. Uh, Emmanu Emmanuel talked, talked about them, and then it finishes uh, with aseptic uh, filling, which we also uh, incorporated through the acquisition of VarNRx last year. We're now one of the very few that are able to serve this workflow truly end-to-end. -end. Very close to this workflow is the viral vector workflow. We are bringing the Cytiva downstream chromatography with the, the pulp filtration and bioreactor. We're now also able to serve this workflow end-to-end. -end. And as a result, um, over the past 18, 24 months, where there was truly a surge in capacity and demand for both viral vector and mRNA, we've been able to install 25 flex factory that thereafter will, will generate uh, consumables and reagents uh, annuities. Now, this innovation story is just starting. Um, and there's still significant barrier to the adoption of uh, those therapies. One of them is cost, still very costly to manufacture. And customers continue to need help to make sure that we help them improve the potency while maintaining the safety of these, uh, of these treatments. So four areas among others that we work on. The first one is digitization. Okay, one patient, one batch, hundreds of pages of manual records that we're moving, enabling customers to move to, uh, to a digital platform, helping them to reduce costs, helping them to improve and guarantee compliance of the, of the batch record. Costs, you'll see upstairs, the process is still very scattered. We're bringing all these instruments together, automating the process with the ambition to reduce the labor cost by up to 50%. Production, we're developing bespoke dedicated viral vector bioreactor. The Icelis uh, adherent bioreactor from PAL is an industry standard and our platform for development of bioreactor going forward. And finally, because th this is not only about manufacturing the therapy, but it's actually bringing it and protecting those cells from the patient and back to the patient, we have the a full suite of dedicated cold chain management equipment just for the cell therapy uh, workflow. Now, we don't do this alone. This space is buoyant with innovations. There is new things coming out every day. And at the heart of our innovation strategy is partnership. And in fact, this business was built around partnerships and acquisition that we scaled up. So a couple of examples here. CCRM up in Toronto, Canada, we work with them. We have we collocate scientists and we work with them on the automation and the, and the, and the scaling of the CAR-T workflow. Uh, ATTC is a partner in the UK where we, we work with them on our cold chain equipment portfolio development. Nucleus Biologic in California, we work with them on cell culture media development. There is still a lot of work that needs to happen and that can happen to enable the growth of these cells in the best possible way. And we work on nucleus biologic, biologics on this. And lastly, Caring Cross. And Caring Cross will be here for our, uh, our panel later. And you'll hear how they um, uh, work on addressing the cost barrier of cell therapy, and we, ha and we work with them uh, in, that, uh, in that endeavor. 
The last example of partnership, a uh, uh, very important one, is the partnership we recently announced with Bayer, and here again, you'll, you'll get to hear from Bayer in a little while. This process that you saw that uh, cured Emily, uh, one patient, one treatment, back to the patient. What if we could use healthy donor cells and from one batch serving multiple patients? And that's what we call the allogenic cell therapy workflow. And so the, pro the, the program we have with Bayer, uh, multi-million dollar co-investments, is about developing uh, scalable end-to-end -end manufacturing uh, solutions for allogenic cell therapy manufacturing. Before I conclude, um, I'd like to bring back Emily so you can hear the second part of, their, of her story. And it was a great day when we finally gave her her T-cells back, her own T-cells that were trained. They checked her bone marrow again, so that's just 23 days after her first dose of T-cells, and she had no cancer. They couldn't find any leukemia in her system. Um, she's nine years cancer-free and coming up on nine years since she spent a night in the hospital. When we develop a cell therapy product, we change the way medicine is practiced in the hospital, and that's innovation. We're creating and influencing a support structure of raw material suppliers, of technology partners, to help us create a piece of our process that we ourselves don't have and doesn't exist off the shelf because we're pioneering in the cell therapy space. It hasn't been done before. Working with companies like Cytiva are essential for us to be able to advance the forefront of cell therapy. We have seen what cell therapy really can do for patients and really not only take away the symptoms, but actually to cure diseases. And what Cytiva is doing is helping the science to be produced in a standardized and industrialized manner. And I think that is, you could say, what we are experts in. We are experts in taking science into industrialization. So this is what brings us to work every day, uh, helping cure the incurable, developing the technology that really are going to enable uh, those fantastic uh, therapies. And it plays to our strength, uh, our 50 or 60 years of expertise in biotechnology development, our scale, our servicing, uh, our ability to invest and partner. And since we are still at a very early stage of, of those therapies, we think we have the ability to set manufacturing standards and in doing so, really being building a long-term sustainable uh, business franchise. Thank you very much. And I think handing it back to John. Thank you, Emmanuel. Okay, we uh, are right at about the time we're gonna take a break, but before we do, one of the traditions here um, when we, we put on Investor Day is to, uh, to donate to uh, causes that are, are very near and dear to us here in, in First Cytiva, that's the uh, Biomedical Science Careers Program charity, um, really helping um, underrepresented um, and create more diversity um, in the uh, biomedical field here. You can see today we've, we've helped 2,000 people um, along that career path at, at Cytiva with a goal to, to actually increase that to 10,000 annually. So um, in, in the, um, honor of the, the, the day that we are here, we're gonna make a donation there as, as, a, as a corporation um, to, to really support that. A um, Couple things before we go to break. Um, we got a lot of folks here, so in, in order to, to make sure that when we go on the Gemba tour that it's in a, an orderly fashion, there's some cubbies and tables over to the side, so if, if you have extra things you're carrying, now's a good time to, to put it over there. Um, you know, when we, when we do go to break, um, that'll just help things progress in an orderly fashion um, when, we, when we do go on the uh, Gemba tours um, a, a little bit later here. Um, and we've got about 15 minutes, so there's some refreshments also kind of back over there on the left and restrooms in the back of the room. So thank you. We'll see you in 15.
Hello, folks, and uh, welcome back. Hope you got a chance to stretch your legs a little bit. Um, we're going to be about half an hour, and then you'll be on to uh, the Gamba Walks. My name's Connor McKechnie. I lead marketing for the combined Paul and Cytiva organizations in the biotechnology group. Uh, you've heard from uh, a lot of executives today uh, in the group. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea for you to hear um, from people who are at the really pointy end um, of the development of new therapies, uh, some of uh, our customers. Uh, so I'm extremely honored and really pleased um, that you were both able to come. Uh, we have Dr. Jens Vogel, who is the Senior Vice President um, and the Global Head of Biotech at Bayer's Pharmaceuticals and Product Supply Organization, large biopharmaceutical company. And then we have uh, Dr. Boro Dropovich, sorry, Dropulich Boro, um, who uh, is the founder of Caring Cross, uh, which is a CAR T cell therapy focused nonprofit organization uh, focused on expanding access uh, to cell therapies to uh, lower and middle income countries. Uh, so, gentlemen, thank you uh, very much. Um, Boro, if I can ask you to maybe introduce yourself a little bit and um, we'll go on to explore where uh, we are today and what the future of these therapies look like. Yeah, thank you for that kind introduction. Yeah, I've been in the space for you know, since the late 1980s. I was a Fogarty Fellow, then at Johns Hopkins. Uh, started my first company. We were the first group in the world to put lentiviral vectors into human clinical trials and establish their safety with Carl John and the University of Pennsylvania team. Later, I started a company called Lentigen. Um, there, we continued the collaboration with Carl and developed the vector that eventually, under Novartis, became Kimriah. Um, so after that, uh, the uh, lentigen was acquired by Multani Biotech. We were very interested in local manufacturing, decreasing the costs, um, and we were very successful in developing a number of candidates and developing this place of care model. Um, I started Caring Cross to address the issues uh, with my co-founder, to address the issues of access. Um, these therapies, although very quite transformative, do cost a lot. And so our goal is to really try to improve access by lowering the cost of goods, improving the technologies, and developing what is called a place of care manufacturing paradigm. And Jens? Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, pleasure to be here and actually not just look into a camera, but being physically present and have faces looking back at me. Um, so I'm in the industry for about 23 years now, um, mostly in large molecules, uh, mostly at uh, Bayer and at Beringer Engelheim for many years. Um, in development and manufacturing of large molecules, worked on over 60 INDs and about eight um, products that we commercialized. I'm really passionate now actually about transforming um, into an organization, a Bayer's biotech organization, into an organization that actually also works on the industrialization of these new therapeutic modalities that we already heard something about today. Um, I think that's, you know, we are on, a, on a, the verge of a revolution really in medicine and we're gonna talk more about this in this panel. And um, it really requires partnering between um, you know, us, uh, innovators, uh, companies like Danaha, Saitiva, to bring this forward. So happy to talk a bit more about that. Thank you, Jens. And, and it really characterizes the nature of the industry to have the two of you from very different parts of um, the ecosystem of people who are developing uh, these therapies. So we have a, a, a very small, innovative, uh, company, and then we have Bayer's history of industrialization um, and, and bringing those therapies in, into access. And of course, you have very different needs as, as organizations, and partnership is, is one of those things. But uh, Boro, can you talk about uh, a little bit uh, through your career the change in the innovation landscape that you've seen um, and what that requires of the industry in terms of partnership? Yeah, absolutely. So um, being through the highs and lows of the cell and gene therapy field to a point where one would think that the field wouldn't go forward. But today, you know, uh, half a dozen approved products, you know, we can use the word cure, transformative medicines. So it's a very exciting time and um, a lot of um, interest and investment in the space. The manufacturing issues remain complex, as we heard about this morning. So that's why partnership with expertise is very, very key for success. Companies try to build their own infrastructure, and it's too complex. So being able to rely on partners that have that expertise to bring things forward, I think, is a very important um, um, idea uh, and concept to keep in mind. 
And, and as a company like Boros yeah, develops a new and an emerging CAR T or, or gene therapy, what's the role then of a large organization like Bayer's and how, how do you get involved in that and, and then sort of drive it towards access for patients? Yeah, I think that that's a crucial piece because when you look at it, we have about 1,300 or so cell and gene therapies in pipelines globally. And uh, most of this innovation comes from small startups, uh, small companies, academia. Um, and I think uh, those are very agile and, and fast, moving this innovation also into the clinic. However, you know, you start with small clinical trials. You make a couple of batches for a handful of patients to get started. Even going into late stage clinical trials where you go for larger patient populations already poses an extreme challenge. Mm -hmm. And so basically we need to use the lessons learned from you know, 30 years ago, from the very beginning of the biotech industry, when everybody saw the potential of protein therapeutics, but nobody really knew exactly how to develop and to manufacture them. And for cells, it starts also at the fundamental product understanding. So for a cell, what even are the critical quality attributes? We are constantly learning about that. Um, and then again, how do we how do we manufacture them? Um, and so this is something that we are really good at. So as a large company, we want to partner with the innovators that um, allow us in an open innovation approach to enter the space faster. But what we bring and what we want to leverage is the ability to make difficult to make products and then use a global footprint to really bring it to patients on a global scale. And it's fascinating because the, the, the developments process and cycle it hasn't changed. We're still going through the phases of clinical trials and so on and so forth, but the actors in those spaces have changed and the relationships be mm -hmm. between them have changed. Uh, Bora, can you, you, you talked a little bit about the manufacturing challenges and, and so on, but can, can you expand a little bit more? What's really difficult about these therapies? We know that they're complex, but what, what is it that you and your scientists in the lab are facing as you try to you know, essentially design them for manufacturing later and making them you know, easy to get out to patients? Yeah, it depends on which track you're taking, where you're tra taking a track on with these personalized medicines to make them one patient at a time. Then you have to think about uh, an idea on, on scaling out rather than scaling up. But if you take the, the other alternative is to do allergenic pr approaches, then you're thinking about scaling up and, and producing that final product out. Um, we are, um, our, our uh, focus has really been on the scaling out of the personalized therapies, taking cells out and very quickly manipulating them and putting them back in. Now the challenge is, is creating very inexpensive workflows that are very robust. Those are the challenges. And so that's what we are as a field trying to tackle. And that involves not only on the cell side, it involves also on the vector manufacturing side, and it also involves on the analytical side, and that all relates to the quality critical quality attributes, as Jen mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, you talked there about um, the, the need for sort of robust manufacturing. Um, Jens, your, your focus is on the allergenaic side. Um, maybe we should just quickly do a little bit of an intro in terms of like the difference between autologous and allergenaic cell therapies. Um, the, the workflows are the same. Uh, in, in many ways, but just characterize for the audience who may not have heard this before. Sure, sure. And it, it, there, there are fundamental differences, and Bo alluded to those already. So for um, uh, autologous, autologous is basically the ultimate personalized therapy, where you basically take the cells from uh, the actual patient, and then you basically train those cells, engineer those cells, uh, to fight the cancer. And then you expand these cells ex vivo, and then transfuse them as an army to basically kill cancer cells, again, in the, in the example. And that was the example that we had or, in the video earlier. Yes, exactly, and Emily Whitehead is a, a perfect example of what these therapies can do. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked in, in pharma all my life, and uh, you know, a lot of times we were working on therapies which ultimately uh, you know, were successful but might have increased median survival by a couple of months. Mm -hmm. True. And now, for the first time, you have something like this, where you see Emily Whitehead, we just celebrated the 10 year anniversary. She was under the, uh, amongst the first CAR T patients um, ever. And 10 years later, she's still cancer free. So that's as close to a cure as you possibly can be. That shows the potential. Now for allogeneic, you can imagine if it's so personalized, it's very difficult to manufacture because you can only scale out. One batch is one patient. Mm -hmm. 
So you have these farms, basically, of uh, small bioreactors, all parallel operation. You will try to automate as, as much as possible. That's where the future there lies. But then allogeneic is basically trying to take healthy donor cells um, and then basically engineer those so that you are not triggering graft versus host or half, host versus graft disease so that basically you can use these cells for many, many patients. So then one batch might be able to ultimately treat hundreds of patients. And it's important to realize that it's not an either or, right? It's not like allogeneic is going to be the future or autologous is going to be the future. It's, it's, it's not a VHS beta max yes. challenge. Um, yes. I'm looking out there and the audience is maybe too yeah. young to yeah. realize the, uh, yeah. the analogy. <laughs> um, but in terms of this sort of manufacturing challenge and that smaller footprint then, mm -hmm. uh, Jens, could you talk a little bit about how important um, the development of single-use um, capabilities, single-use biomanufacturing, and adapting that for, for cell therapies has been in the last, what, five or ten years? No, absolutely. I mean, again, for allogeneic, um, a lot of the platforms that we need to truly industrialize it don't exist yet. Now, our vision is to basically create something akin to a consensus platform. Just for those of you who've maybe observed the biotech industry, what made the industrialization, the true industrialization of antibodies possible was that the industry converged onto a consensus platform with fat patch bioreactors, protein A, and so on. Uh, Cytiva plays an important role in this and others. Um, now, that allows you basically to transfer processes and translate from a lab into manufacturing from one side to another side and so on, true industrialization. Mm -hmm. We don't have that for cell therapy. So again, we focus on allogeneic, but even there you have many different cell types that have specific needs. So the vision is to create a platform that is modular and flexible, where you then have a roadmap and you look at, okay, I need for this particular cell type, I need that module, that module, that module, and that module. They're all using single-use components. They all operate on the same operating system, and you can plug them together, and it's sort of plug and play. You have the basic element of a platform to produce very rapidly. Mm -hmm. That's what we are trying to build, and that's why we as Bayer are partnering now with Cytiva, because we need a partner with the deep expertise and manufacturing capabilities in both the equipment and then, very important, the consumables. Mm -hmm. Um, because, again, all of that will be based on single-use technology. And we combine that with our expertise in product development, science and technology development. And it's so together we can really set, hopefully, a new industry standard in that yeah. space. It's, it's really interesting listening to you speak. The, the, it's almost the language of software development, right? You're talking about plug and play. You're talking about platforms and so on. And this combination of biology and engineering and and, and digital. And digital. Mm -hmm. um, Bora, could you talk a little bit about how that's sort of going to enable the future of these therapies, bringing those multiple disciplines together? Oh, that's essential, even in autologous therapies. You know, it's the same kind of platform. Um, what we envisage is, is that instead of scaling up, having very, very short processes, right, and then working with partners, we've got a partnership with Cytiva, is to try to really reduce the time, because reducing the time really reduces the cost, right? And when you have a personalized therapy, it becomes very, very straightforward to do it at the place of care, right, either in a, in a modular clean room, but, but the big advantage of this is that you can do fresh in and fresh out manufacturing. And what we have learned is, is that fresh product manufactured is more potent than frozen product. So these are the, some of the advantages. But there are caveats and advantages in all these approaches. And I think we just have to go down this path and figure it out. But these modular systems, I think, are common. A lot of them are common to both platforms. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as somebody who's a newcomer to the space or is just getting up to speed, it can seem very, very confusing. There's sort of there's mRNA, there's lipids, there's viral vectors, there's viral gene therapies, there's CAR T cell therapies, and so on. Um, there's so many different things going on. But is there something that underlies all of it that, that you could say is, well, if you take a systemic approach, these are the core characteristics mm -hmm. of, of what you're going to see. You, 
you've talked a little bit about the challenges in, in, in manufacturing. You've talked a little bit about sort of the platform uh, approach that's been taken. Is there anything else that really kind of unites these therapies in the way that people ought to be thinking about them uh, in the future? Yeah, Laura? particularly the quality systems that surround the manufacturing of the product. I think that's very, very key and that's very, very common. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. The analytics, right, and um, even some of the platforms in terms of sharing, even some of the bioreactor processes can also be common. So we need to be able to see what's going on inside the bioreactor yep. um, as, as the cells are being grown or uh, as the proteins are being developed. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Jens? Yeah, I think it's you know, automation, digitalization, and uh, above all, really, really sound product understanding. Mm. So that's required for all these new modalities mm. because, again, it's still in its infancy. And from a technology perspective, of course, um, you said it earlier, a lot of these will coexist for many, many, many years and mm. decades to come. Mm. Um, I think there will be a certain amount of shakeout ultimately perhaps with the uh, cell types, uh, mm -hmm. but um, you know, a lot of these uh, technologies also work in tandem and mm -hmm. approaches. Mm. So for example, advances in gene editing, uh, of course help us in cell therapy, they help us in gene mm -hmm. therapy. Um, vectors or also vectorless gene editing uh, helps us for the cell therapy, mm -hmm. so it's basically, it's all not completely converging, but it's uh, um, uh, inspiring each other mm. in the different modalities. Can, can we turn a little bit to sort of the future technology needs? I mean, we've talked about the need for automation and clo closing systems or, or, or bring, bringing the cost down. But what, what could you see happening in the next sort of 10 to 15 years in this space? What should we be excited about from a, from a first let's take the technology point of view rather than the biology. From, from a manufacturing standpoint, where, where are things possibly going and what would that mean actually for the end patient? My bias is, is that um, you know, um, localized manufacturing, that, that's my personal bias, um, that we're moving more and more towards very short processes and making it localized just because of the reduced cost of goods, of avoiding that whole um, infrastructure logistical aspect of transporting from centralized manufacturing facilities and back. I think that's certainly, it really depends upon the science and which therapies prove to be durable, right? And so whether it's allogeneic or autologous, it's the best therapy that we really need to be aiming for and then build those systems around that to make those therapies really distributed correctly for an affordable cost. Mm. And, and that, that affordability is key to expanding it beyond the US and Europe, right? Absolutely. I mean, the current pricing of, you know, three seventy, four hundred thousand. Um, uh, over a million dollars is really not even sustainable um, in the US, um, let alone in low middle income countries. But by focusing on decreasing the cost of goods and innovations to um, decrease the manufacturing time and cost, we can actually create value and create products that can be reimbursed and sustainably reimbursed um, in the US and also then create space for cost plus pricing, say in low middle income countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jens, cost, absolutely key, and cost is coming down, and we're, see we're seeing that year on year, and that's, that's very exciting. Um, what else in terms of like, te technologically uh, in the future? What, 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 as a large farmer, do you see being most exciting? Well, I think there, there are so many aspects. Again, autologous, I totally agree with Boro. I'm, I'm really excited about the ability to control stemness, for example, better understand how important that is, avoid uh, exhaustion, yeah. and then basically be able to reduce the expansion time in the factory as much as possible. And what I find fascinating is, um, and I'm discussing a lot about that also with uh, uh, colleagues and peers, is can we ultimately get to the point where we skip the ex vivo expansion completely yeah. and we basically have truly a point of care. So then you don't have yeah, maybe you can still call it local manufacturing, but you have to envision it almost like a dialysis clinic uh, in the major hospitals and treatment centers. So that's something that I'm excited about. Um, on the other end, then, with allogeneic approaches, um, still the ability then to, like in the traditional um, drug uh, model, to have centralized manufacturing, and then you basically have a universal cell bank, and you're able to ship this anywhere to the, uh, on the globe, Mm. and infuse it, I mean, that, of course, would solve a lot of the challenges. Yeah. It, it seems just, like, just incredibly exciting that something like um, a, a curative CAR-T cell therapy could be 
maybe uh, not necessarily as simple, but as, uh, as efficiently uh, administered as dialysis mm -hmm. um, uh, has been um, developed over the last sort of 30 years. Or as an infusion of an allergenic. Yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. absolutely. Is there also the other possibility of using the vector directly, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Although there is a high bar because you're now putting the vector in a more uncontrolled environment mm -hmm. rather than isolating your target cell type having that as your final product. But there are a number of companies working in this area to actually use vectors directly mm. as a final product. In that case, you don't need to take out the cells at all. Mm. Uh, but again, uh, the, I think there is a relatively high threshold there to make Thank that you. really work. Mm. Yeah. So if you remember, Manuel about, uh, talked about the fact that you need to put the DNA or the RNA, the coding, into something to get it to the patient, into the vector. So using the vector directly as something, uh, as a therapeutic that then is targeted at the right place um, for the patient. In vivo gene like editing is something yeah. that, that I think eventually will come. Mm -hmm. I think the bar is high. We have a collaboration with Mammoth Bioscience yeah. on uh, programs that could eventually lead us there. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I, I do believe we get there in certain indications at some point. Yes, but mm. <laughs> totally. I, I mean, you know, Emily Whitehead, the the example. I, it's it's spine chilling because ten years ago, when she was first diagnosed, and you know, we had the um, the honor of being sort of part of the development of that therapeutic process. Just to see that actually happening, it felt a little bit science fictiony, and now it's not. It's it's fact. It's happening. So when you talk about these innovations as things that are, you know, potentially a long way off, um, they are going to come. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some things that uh, I think will come very soon, which we haven't talked about. Uh, we focus really very much on cancer here right now. Now, one area that is very close to my heart, and we are working a lot of that, is um, using uh, induced pluripotent stem cells uh, for regenerative therapies. So that is a form of sort of next generation cell therapy which sometimes still to me also sounds a bit like science fiction. So we basically take cells uh, from a healthy donor, we actually engineer them to become pluripotent. So then you can differentiate them into any kind of cell type a human body has. So our first program that's already in the clinic that uh, comes from our Blue Rock uh, partners um, is in Parkinson's. So uh, we basically take these cells, we differentiate them into healthy brain cells that are producing dopamine which Parkinson's patients don't have anymore. And then we can basically transplant them into somebody's brain to hopefully cure them. Mm -hmm. And the next program that I just have to mention because it is really exciting, is a heart failure program, just to show you where we can go. So you basically differentiate these IPCs into heart cells, you grow them in a bioreactor, and I can tell you one of the most exciting moments of my life was seeing in the lab, suddenly these heart cells start to beat in sync. Mm. And the idea is that you can basically then transplant them into a damaged heart, mm. and they will basically associate with the damaged heart, repair the damage, and start to synchronize with, this, with the heart cells, so they can basically mend a broken heart. Extraordinary. <laughs> and, and maybe spiritually as well. Um, so look, th this, is, this is very, you know, we, we get very excited about this. Um, could you talk a little bit, I mean, I, I, I'm not asking you to shill for Cytiva and Danaher and so on, but could you talk a little bit about what um, prompted you to choose to work with, with this organization? Um, it, it, the experience, the technology, the people, what, what is it? That... It's a combination of all of those, mm -hmm. those factors. So we've worked with Cytiva for a long time and we're still GE Healthcare and even before. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we, again, need somebody who understands the technology, who has the uh, manufacturing capabilities, the know-how, um, very importantly, shares the same vision. Mm -hmm. And I think this, in, in this current partnership, this was one of the decisive factors. I mean, we started talking about allogeneic cell therapy, it became very clear that our teams share the vision of where we need to go mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, and the capabilities are all there. And, um, and that's why we're going to be successful. And, and Boro, yourself, very different needs as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, there are many places you could have gone. Why, why partner with Cytiva? Well, it's the same reason. You have a deep expertise in the space. And again, I want to stress 
and um, underline the importance of that in this space. Because if you work with a group that hasn't got that level of expertise, um, you are bound to hit the rocks at some point. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the main reasons. And also, you've picked the right platforms. You know, when you look at the single-use disposable kind of platforms, mm -hmm. that's clearly the way of the future. Mm -hmm. And so um, knowing that um, you'll be behind those platforms for the longer term, mm -hmm. which we're investing in, that um, is very important for us. It builds confidence in our partnership that you'll be there and helping us as we evolve and making these processes the way that we think they need to be made for, this, for our place of care manufacturing model. Mm -hmm. So irrespective of the number of patients, the number of bags, yeah. the number of transfer yeah. sets that are required, the, 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 the cell culture media and so on, it's, all, it's, it's always going to be there as you develop. Um, as we move towards the, the close of the session, um, just one last question. Um, everyone here has made a real effort to get here, and we want to thank them for that. So what can we give them um, in terms of a, sort of a, a nugget of information that perhaps they should know about the industry that people who miss the session um, won't know? So they can go on their way with a little bit of you know, extra knowledge. Um, Jens. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, I'm not going to give out any investment advice here. <laughs> yeah. um, now, you know, I think one thing that, that most of you, I, I, I think, will already know. I mean, we talked about a lot of revolutionary approaches. One thing, of course, always in pharma. If you look at any individual asset, any individual therapy that someone is working on, the risk of failure is very high, right? That's always the case. So the concept can be as brilliant as you, know, you want, but you might still encounter unanticipated things in the clinic, and so it might fail. The trick is platforms. Having platforms that can generate many assets, um, and that's you know, what we are trying to do as is, is, is Bayer, working with someone like um, uh, Blue Rock uh, or Ars Bio, who basically create platforms that can then generate asset after asset after asset, because some of these absolutely will be successful. Mm -hmm. And the same in the technology space, um, the platforms ultimately will help us to get to the revolution that we're after. Mm -hmm. So whether you're talking about the actual, the biology, look for the biology platform, or the manufacturing technology, look for the, manu the manufacturing technology uh, platform. Borrow, what would you say? Yeah, um, it's, it's partnering with a, a group that not only has solutions, but has a vision for the end-to-end -end solution. We've heard a lot about that today, and that's key, very important, and not every company does this. So having that vision that you're tackling every aspect of that workflow, every aspect of that analytic is important, and it builds real confidence um, in um, any partnership. So I just wanted to leave you that. That's important for us and any partner, I think. Okay. Well, listen... Thank you both very much. Um, it's been a joy uh, getting to know uh, you and your, uh, your, your organizations and your work a, li a little bit more. Um, I would uh, ask uh, Emmanuel to uh, come back to the stage. Yes, Is that right? Absolutely. And um, we'll uh, head off. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Jens, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Connor, thank you. Again, huge thank you for our guests, uh, Jens from Bayer and, and Boro for caring. And I hope it gave you a sense of, uh, of the partnership. I'm going just to uh, very quickly wrap up and summarize before uh, we move to our, to our Q&A session. We're creating an absolutely leaders in the bioprocessing industry, Pal and Sati back together it is a stronger offering for our customers. I think you heard Boro saying that one of the most important things for him is a partner which is going to look at end to end. And I hope you understand that this is what we're doing with our product portfolio, with our talent, with our services. So the biotechnology group is now a leader across all modalities, including monoclonal antibody, cell engine therapy, and mRNA. We have a strong secular driver in biologics, which creates significant long-term growth opportunity on the long-term projection of high single digit, uniquely positioned for the most comprehensive offering, best in class services, support, and scale. Scale of manufacturing, scale of talent, scale of commercial, scale of organic, and the ability with the Danara business system 
to continuously improve our service to customers. I hope you enjoy the talk. You will have an opportunity after the Q&A session to go in the game bar to listen about what we're doing in sustainability, to see the workflow monoclonality body, to see the CAR T uh, workflow that Jans and Boro was talking about, and also to see basically what we're doing in terms of commercial processes and, and, and how we win commercially. But I think now it's time for inviting uh, Reiner, Amanda, and Emmanuel back on stage for some Q&A. Thank you very much. Start with Dan over here. <coughs> <laughs> no worries. Too many Dan's. Too many Dan's. Too many Dan's. No worries. Well, he was pointing at Dan Leonard, but this is uh, Dan Brennan from Cowan, so I guess Hi, I'll Dan. kick it off. Thank you. Thanks for doing the day. Um, I thought I would just um, kick it off just with a high-level question, just as you kind of raise the Danaher growth rate here as EAS kind of separates out to kind of high single digits. Um, you know, as we look across the different um, buckets of businesses, you know, obviously the genomics business, 30% plus today before we even get to a broader commercial uh, stage in the, in the market, if you will, and the MABs at mid-team. So it just, you know, it appears to us as we look at it, um, well, high single digits are detractive. I'm just wondering, um, you know, where the conservatism is baked in there, because if we just do the simple math, you would imply something certainly north of that, even if you look out over the next five or 10 years, I think just given what we're seeing on the stage today and the proliferation of all these new modalities. So maybe you can just maybe focus in on the biotech group, high single maybe as a proxy and a little more color about uh, you know, how, how we should think about that growth rate. Want me to start as we're talking about biotechnology? Um, I think when we join um, Danaher, we talk a lot about um, you know, five to six, seven percent seven percent growth. And I think when we really look at at the trajectory where we can go on, on, on the production, you know, I single digit, I think, uh, I think it's the right number. I, I would just add, um, as, we, as we look forward and we look at our own models, um, you know, I do think that there's some degree of a prudence and conservatism that we build into these models because, as I uh, have mentioned here uh, offline, you know, we do think about the seven to ten year model uh, and not just the one to three year model. And when you uh, project uh, growth rates, you know, pick a number, uh, well into the double digits uh, for uh, 10 years off of large bases, you know, the, it potentiates um, uh, quite, quite a bit into numbers that, um, you know, make, make you uh, question that. And so we, we tend to uh, look also back at the last 10 years and see whether linear growth models uh, were predictive and applicable, and frankly, they haven't been. Uh, the growth comes in spurts, and then sometimes it slows down a little bit, and then it goes again. And so we just think in the long term it's better to be thinking about these businesses in the high single digit uh, area, if you think about the scale of what we're talking about. Um, not to say that there can't be uh, periods where that would be higher, uh, but we suspect that uh, for all the things that are happening around us in the world that we don't control, uh, that there may also be periods where that's not the case. And, and it's not much more complicated than, than that as we think about 10-year time spans. I guess one follow-up just on biosimilars. Obviously, you talked about it here today, and you've talked about it in the past and as, a, as an opportunity as these volumes grow into the emerging markets. Uh, but at the same time, with all these new entrants coming in, these new biopharma players, you're the dominant chair today on the, on the branded drug. Just wondering what you've seen some, from some of the early experiences and your ability to maintain the share uh, from all these new players that maybe could look to maybe some cheaper alternatives or you know other alternatives uh, versus Danaher? That's a very good question. I mean, biosimilar is, is a good thing. You know, it's a good thing because it brings those life-changing therapy to many more patients around the world. Um, it's interesting to think that a biosimilar company is going to work with us to make their process more efficient, and they are 20 years later the originators. So different cell line, different cell culture media, you know, different processes. Sometimes 
single-use technology, which, as I said, is, is, is um, more productive than, than the other. So, but we still work with the originator because the originator may go into a second generation or a third generation of processes, and we, we, do that, we do that with them as well. So I think both give us opportunity, originator into the next generation or, or biosimilar across the world. We can't hear you, Dan. Do a testing. Testing. All right, you're good. All right, perfect. Uh, All right. Thanks for taking the question. Thank you for the deep dive, Reiner and team. Dan Leonard here, the other Dan. A question on, on the integration and creation of the biotech division. You, you typically don't integrate opcos at Danaher, so I'm wondering or curious about what was the tipping point to drive the integration here, and how might that apply to decisions to do something similar elsewhere in the portfolio? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, uh, and there's a couple factors here that intersect uh, to us making that decision. First of all, we are really looking um, at the same customers here uh, for Paul and Cytiva. So we're not in the same parking lot. We're in the same building and office uh, with the same, really, uh, procurement uh, and scientific personas uh, that are looking at these um, particular solutions. And so that, you know, that's certainly a factor. Uh, that's important to us, and also the customer requests that we've gotten over time to ensure that we have seamless, not only interfaces, but technologies and collaborations and services, which they just see as such a huge benefit as the team has been talking about. So that's, that's really a key factor here. There's another key factor um, as to the timing, you know, you know why now? Well, we talked about the complex uh, process of acquiring the business during a pandemic, so carving it out first, phase one, right? Standing it up and operating it as an independent company to ensure that we deliver and fire on all cylinders. And then lastly, now taking that step and being able to bring these businesses together uh, for the benefit of all the stakeholders. So that's really been driving um, the uh, thinking uh, and the decision making there. Now. Uh, First of all, we never say never in terms of, will you do this again? We never say never. Um, but I wouldn't say that this is going to be you know, the new mantra. We look at each situation individually, and we make a call uh, that's based really on what the marketplace and our customers are looking for and need from us, uh, and then we'll make the necessary adjustments. This is uh, Vijay Kumar from um, Evercore. Um, Vijay. All the way in the back, Reiner. Where are you? There you are. There you are. <laughs> um, just one on uh, following on the uh, last question from Dan. Has your go-to-market strategy changed now that uh, Paul and Saitiv are together? Maybe talk about your competitive win rates and what's changed in the marketplace. Can you just repeat a uh, go-to-market and then? Your go-to-market yeah. strategy now that these two assets are together, how has it changed versus uh, two years ago? And are you winning more uh, competitive wins? So I'll start, and then maybe okay. you, you pick up uh, you pick up the, the pieces. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, sorry, it was a bit hard to um, to hear you. Um, go to market is very important, but you have to see that we have an opportunity to deploy more resources to a broader range. Okay, and and to cover maybe some segments better that we used to cover before. And I'm thinking in particular the translational segments as we are um, building up uh, more products, in particular in the cell and gene therapy, it gives us an opportunity to really have segments which are very dedicated, you know, cover it, market segments that in the past we could not cover uh, really much the same way. So really putting the two team together gave us an opportunity to cover uh, much broader customers. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that was really the remit. I mean, we have fantastic scale now bringing the two commercial organizations together. We really wanted to increase our coverage. So the number of customers that we cover, we talked earlier about, you know, we're, we're really gaining new customers at a fairly significant rate in the, in the biotech sector. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we could bring the depth to, to those customers so, you know, we can reduce our territories. And that just enables us to get a much better breadth of coverage across the different customer segments. So translation, academia, uh, biotech, but really you know, maintaining the focus on our, our big revenue generating customers and CDMOs and, and CDMOs. biopharma. 
so that it just allows us to really enhance that approach globally. And I think, Vijay, just one thing, in the Game by Walk, you will have an opportunity to see the process that we put behind the commercial team, which is a process which is standard, which has been enhanced with the DBS. So you will have an opportunity to see, uh, to see the go-to-market the way that we are doing it now. And again, the Power Life Science sales team will come into that process. So again, we'll see that advantage as, as we bring the two teams together. That, that, that's helpful. And Reiner, maybe one for you. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you on M&M. &M. Uh, the last time we had a spin, we had Cytiva. Now we had EAS. I mean, just talk about broadly what you see out there, what areas interest you. You, know, you mentioned seven to 10 years outlook. You know, when, you, when you put that seven to 10 year hat, uh, what kind of assets do you see out there which are interesting? Well, I'll tell you, we um, first of all have to come back to the portfolio that we have. Uh, the EAS announcement is uh, 12 hours or so, 20, just about yes, 24 just, hours or so <laughs> old, and uh, uh, it's going to take us uh, to you know, the end of next year, really, to, to complete that transaction. Uh, but having said that, as uh, you rightly point out, um, we are very active in the field of M&A. Our uh, funnels are as full as ever. Uh, and we will continue with our strategy to look at um, uh, the uh, white spaces uh, of scale, always focusing on you know, strategy and market first, then identifying the company, and then ultimately ensuring that the business case uh, works. And if all those three turn green, as we say in DBS, um, you know, then we'll pull the trigger. And you know, we're currently in an environment in which we have historically performed very well from an M&A perspective. Uh, it, in times of dislocation, uh, the number of opportunities uh, increase, uh, and we have several assets today in our portfolio. Cyx comes to mind uh, of scale, and there are others um, that uh, we precisely were able to acquire uh, in this kind of time period. So expect us to continue to prioritize uh, our capital deployment towards M&A, uh, and that will happen uh, at all scale levels, from large to small. Thank you. Hey, Ryan. Uh, Patrick Donnelly with City. Thanks, for, thanks for the time. Um, maybe on the guidance, back to the guidance, on the core bioproduction side, you know, you guys have been growing, you know, I think you grew 20% plus in 2Q, you know, guiding a little more high single. Some of the peers are talking more low double even in the go forward. Can you just talk about, I guess, the near-term drivers that are enabling that growth and then how durable, how sustainable those are and kind of when we transition to, to more of the high single, just trying to think about that guidance versus what we're seeing here recently and obviously, again, all these growth drivers you guys are talking about. Sure. A couple things. Um, first of all, it, it's very clear that we're coming with a tailwind that is based on, you know, COVID therapeutics as well as vaccines. And as those wane, and we have, you know, called that out pretty clearly, right, $2 billion in two th uh, 2021, a billion here in 2022, and we'd expect, you know, 500 million or so in 2023. At the same time, we have the no, the non-COVID applications, uh, you know, growing at very fast rates, and you know, we've talked about those uh, being in the mid-teens plus here, uh, and that's what we, we're currently seeing, and that's what our order book shows uh, here going forward. Um, and you know, when we come to the high single digits, it's once again. Uh, uh, a perspective that is not tied to any single year and the dynamics of it, any single year, but to say, you know, this is the kind of very positive scaled market growth that we see. And there aren't that many markets in the world of this scale that are growing at high single digits every year. Uh, and there will be years when that market is growing in the mid-teens or more, hopefully not pandemic related, uh, because there's plenty of other reasons as we heard from our customers here for that to occur. Uh, but there will also be years, undoubtedly, for whatever uh, reason or disruption uh, that won't be so high. So once again, as we're thinking about 10-year models, uh, that's how we're thinking about it in the high single digits. And sure, it'll be better in some years. Uh, that's helpful. And then, and then a quick follow-up on uh, Vijay's M&A question. You know, recently, you've been a little more growth-focused, obviously, Aldevron, maybe even Cytiva. Um, but today, you talked a little bit about some of the old ones, Cyx, Beckman, Leica, even Paul, where you bought these companies with, I think you called them problems, and uh, quickly solved them, drove growth higher, and stripped out costs. I guess, how do you think about that balance, growth versus maybe some of those legacy Danaher deals where you bought things that maybe weren't necessarily growth accretive immediately, but there were big synergies and you were able to drive the growth higher pretty quickly? It's a great question. 
Um, let's start off. We never say problems about everything. We, saw, we say challenges or, or issues uh, because we view them as being fixable, right? Um, but uh, that aside, um, once again, we look at markets first. Then we look at the assets um, that have either the opportunity or the potential that come with that type of growth and potential for earnings improvement. Uh, and then we look at our, our, um, our business case. And there's a bunch of decisions that we're making along that uh, continuum there. Uh, and we believe uh, that a premium asset with an outstanding brand, perhaps that is struggling uh, with the one or the other issues, sometimes uh, uh, Companies stub their toes. If I if I think of you know Troponin and Beckman Coulter uh, back in 2011, uh, and that suddenly creates uh, an opportunity for us. And so um, I think we look at each one of these individually, uh, and we uh, measure our own capabilities to influence uh, the dynamic of that particular asset. As long as we feel that we're in a market where we're swimming with the current as opposed to against the current. Or maybe one more here. Thank you, Jack Meehan with Nefron hey, Research. Uh, recently, the Biden administration has had some updates related to strengthening uh, our biomanufacturing footprint. I was wondering if you've thought about what that can mean for Danaher and some of the services that you provide. Sure. Uh, so uh, first of all, we're, we're thrilled to see uh, that this has become a part of the national priorities. And in fact, I'm part of a working group on um, uh, supply chain uh, security here in the, US, uh, in the U.S., which is chaired by uh, Secretary Raimondo. Uh, and so these kinds of discussions uh, are not entirely new to us. But I will say this, um, that, uh, you know, the bioeconomy is a huge opportunity for our generation and the next several uh, in order to solve all kinds of challenges, whether they be environmental, health-related, food security, uh, you name it. Uh, and so uh, this effort, uh, uh, which, you know, we, we believe makes a lot of sense, is one that we feel that our portfolio uh, can add value to. But it's a bit early days to understand how that all plays out. It's still a little bit early, uh, but clearly we're uh, part of the mix there. Okay, well, I think that concludes our Q&A session uh, and our formal comments here. So we want to thank all of you.